before Steve Dunn uh, gives you the overall of the conference, I'd like to open it up with a little prayer, uh, the Our Father. But this is the Our Father taken from the Maui people of New Zealand, and this is how they have translated our traditional prayer into their own cosmological thought. So if you just kind of close your eyes and put yourself in the universe. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that will be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings and your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From the trials too great to endure, spare us. And from the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And again, good morning to all. I would like to give you a quick overview of where we're going uh, today. It is, um, it's a short day, but it has lots of content and I think lots of things to enjoy. So if you want to take a look quickly at the program itself, it might help. The topic, of course, is bringing together the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si and the wisdom of Thomas Berry. As passionists, we're very proud of uh, Thomas's contribution to ecological thinking uh, as well as uh, spiritual depth. And we feel that that has been picked up and uh, delivered in its own way by the Pope and very successfully. So we have two main speakers who are very proficient in both of those topics, uh, Mary Evelyn and uh, John. You'll see how proficient as they begin to talk. They are going to be responded to by three different panels, panels of two. And that picks up on three topics. One is education, uh, both religious and secular. Uh, the other is intercultural life, particularly in a parish, but can be anywhere. Uh, and then the third is the accent is on youth. So those three uh, kind of themes by way of response. Obviously, uh, there are more, more ways to respond than that, but, but th that might get us uh, well in train for understanding the input of Mary Ellen and John. And then finally, uh, in the afternoon, a workshop, three workshops. So each, each of those three dimensions offers an opportunity for you to uh, give your own response in a, in a small context of a workshop. And we hope you work in the workshop because it, it will be, be very beneficial. We will have lunch, it'll be right here. Uh, we will also have, at that time, a presentation of uh, an award to Mary Evelyn and John uh, expressing the uh, uh, gratitude of the Passionist community for the work that they do. And then finally, at the, at the end of the day, we'll have some music from uh, some of the, the uh, talented young people in the school and uh, also a reception. So those are the uh, general aspects. The, the other thing to, to be constantly aware of is that we do not have a lot of time. 
uh, because it's a short program, but we do want to make it uh, move along pretty much according to schedule. So I'd like now to introduce Mary Evelyn. Most of you saw her uh, in action last night uh, as she answered the, the questions. There's so many things about Mary Evelyn that uh, are important that um, in a tight schedule you don't have the uh, luxury of developing them. But it, it's important to, to remember that she's been a part of the, uh, the wide response to uh, climate change, even uh, participating very early, uh, right from the beginning, in the process, for example, of the Earth Charter. And as a scholar, uh, her own investment in uh, Asian uh, understanding and Asian religion made her uh, very compatible with Thomas Berry's uh, vast approach to Asian religion as well. Beyond that, uh, she and John have been super productive. Um, and it's, it's impossible to exaggerate it. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to get into it. Better to listen to her. But 10 volumes, in, interfaith study of various religions and uh, the ecological question. The movie that you saw, which took uh, 10 years to produce, uh, and she was a co-writer of that. One thing that makes her very close to Thomas Berry, I think, is that from the beginning of Thomas's publishing career, he used to put out those um, little blue uh, mimeograph things that some of you would, might remember. But to move him into print, she was very instrumental in that and remained uh, close by him as he progressively published more. And that we are the beneficiary of because without that, uh, we'd still be plowing through those little blue books and that wouldn't be too much fun. So please welcome with me, Mary Evelyn Tucker. Thank you, Steve, and Tom, Brendan, Heavey, and Bill Murphy, and all of you who came this morning, old friends from Iona, uh, new friends from Korea. It's really a pleasure and a joy to be here and to have a dear friend like Megan Rice, a family friend from so many years, is very, very special. So I'm deeply moved when I think I'm in a building, actually, where Thomas lived, where he prayed, where he met people at the door. He always described the Jamaican monastery as the place where he was a doorman. And sometimes he would feel, well, what was my role? I'm just a doorman. And he would say to, uh, to Ted DeBerry, the great Confucian scholar, his close friend, Ted would say to him, well, Confucius was a gatekeeper too, so you have a role. Um, in any case, I do think in this community here, but in the Passionist community, in the various places where he lived, he developed a profound spirituality, a mystical insight clearly, a contemplative spirit that radiated wherever he went. So we are grateful to the Passionist for that, and especially for the sense that he always felt he was part of a cosmic liturgy. You know, this came out in his writing so beautifully. So, having said that, we're celebrating the Passionist who nurtured Thomas for so many years. So, let's begin with an applause for the Passionist and Thomas. <laughs> Now, we're right into things that he would care about because he was such a prophet. And if he was here, he would be right on to climate change and so on. So we're beginning with this sense that we all know of refugees around the world and how are we going to respond to them. Um, the sense that we're in this period of environmental refugees of which the social justice challenges that the church has held is now being challenged as never before because there are going to be over 90 million, there are 
90 million refugees from environmental issues around the world, migrant seekers. We're going to Germany tomorrow. Germany has taken in one million people. Imagine what that is requiring of their social structures. Trafficking, which the church is dealing with, and fundamentalisms, political and religious around the world. Racism that we see everywhere, not only in our own country. So the social justice challenges are immense, but now the challenge of the encyclical is as well to deal with environmental issues which are affecting the most vulnerable among us. All over, we've been to conferences in Venice many, many times. The seas are rising in Venice. The seas are rising in Miami. The Bishop of Miami, fortunately, is a great supporter of the encyclical. Um, all along our coastal waters, especially the East Coast, the Norfolk uh, Naval site is deeply threatened. This is not simply an abstraction. It is very real. The oceans, we've just gotten word this week from the World Congress of uh, Environment, how terrifically acidified they are and what that means for coral, for fish, et cetera. The toxicity of water, of soil, of land around the world. Flint, Michigan is a, simply one small indication. If you could see China, India, the, many of you have traveled broadly speaking, this is a global issue now. What is going to be the response of the religious communities? The loss of biodiversity, which the Pope mentions, is stunning. We are in a period of extinction called the Sixth Extinction Period that Pope's encyclical mentions right at the beginning, the importance of all the species of life. This broadening of the fabric of life is what we are called to. So Thomas, as we know, said, we have ethics for homicide and suicide and genocide, but not for biocide or ecocide. These are powerful words, and people are quoting Thomas now with this kind of phrase. We need to expand our ethics beyond the human. It is imperative, and we need to do it with the urgency that's required. This magnificent phrase that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Subjectivity is the Christic within all life, the fabric of a divine milieu. This is the beauty of something that's divinized the whole universe. That is what Thomas was drawing us to. It's a magnificent vision in the midst of tremendous challenges. It gives us hope, this Teardian vision, this Thomas vision. So what are we doing then to leverage moral transformation? We have clearly secular environmental ethics, a land ethic of Aldo Leopold. This is what the environmentalists have been doing for a long time. We need to join them with the force of moral power that's equivalent to the civil rights movement in this country when everything changed, when we said this is a moral issue. When we are able to say with conviction and with information, this is a moral issue, we have faith that things can change. So that's what the world's religions and their e ecological dimensions are beginning to contribute. The encyclical is a watershed, an absolute watershed. In our lifetime, I think it's the most magnificent document in many ways that we have to make this transition. And certainly Journey of the Universe, the story of where we've come from is another contribution to this transformation. So the promise of the religions, the encyclical wel welcomes religious dialogue. The Pope's not just speaking to Catholics, he's speaking to everyone around the world. And the scientists know we're going to Potsdam uh, tomorrow for a conference that's in the Science Institute for Climate Change. The scientists are welcoming this perspective. The leader of that institute, Hans Schulnuberg, was very close to the formation of the encyclical and so on. So the scientists want this, you see. We're not being left on the margins. So we've got large numbers of people. We've got moral transformation to bring to bear. And what we've been trying to do is to help create a field in academia and a force in the larger society for these changes. So just briefly, at Harvard, and I think this was the universe opening. It honestly had nothing to do with us, but it said, when we were there on sabbatical, let's begin a process of examining Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the Asian religions, and so on. 
retrieving what are their views of nature. You see, then reevaluating how does that relate to our present circumstance and reconstructing. Eco theology has emerged. You can't imagine the number of books and articles that are booming out, um, and that's very exciting. So we did these, these books that Steve mentioned. 800 scholars and, and laity participated in this. It was very, very broad. Um, and we s established this forum on religion and ecology at Yale. We're in a secular university. You see, this is unusual. And I keep saying the universe is making its way through this work. Um, and we need your prayers <laughs> to do it as well. We've got a website with the resources for educators, syllabi, how you teach it. You can sign up on the newsletter and, and see what's happening in various parts of the world. We have a section on climate change. But here's what we've also been working on for 20 years with Orbis Books, and they were good to help get some books here today. This was a series where we said, of course, we have to bring ecology and justice together because the church has a strong justice component, but the ecology needed to be integrated with it. And that's what the encyclical represents. So we've got Brian Swim's book, we've got Thomas's book, The Christian Future and the Fate of Earth, with our book, Worldviews and Ecology, Just Water, the women's issue with Rosemary Ruther, and um, the issues of Native Americans. But the one in the middle I wanted to highlight, and that's Leonardo Boff, the liberation theologian from Brazil. And he, for years, has been writing what is really integral ecology, and he was immensely influential on the encyclical. And who is he influenced by? Thomas Berry. Because years ago, the liberation theologians had justice in their frame. They didn't have ecology. And Thomas said, you can't free people without the earth without an earth that's healthy and nourishing. So Leonardo got this message, he got the new story, it's in all of his writings uh, from that time forward. So again, Thomas seeded in so many different areas this, and, and this special synthesis of ecology and justice coming forward. So we've done panels on religion and climate change starting in 2001 uh, at Harvard of getting the different world religions to weigh in, getting the scientists to come forward and say how this moral uh, issue could, could help what they're doing. But what I wanted to highlight here is that Yale, in April of last year, before the encyclical came out, the whole academic year, our dean at Yale kept saying to us, what are we gonna do about the encyclical? We know it's important. He's a scientist. He was head of Kew Botanical Gardens in England. He was head of the Field Museum, Science. He wanted the encyclical to be known at Yale. And we did a, quite a wonderful panel with him beginning by saying this is no longer an issue of science. This is a moral issue and a religious issue. You can see the panel um, on uh, YouTube or whatever. But I just want to highlight that, you see, we are being drawn into this conversation uh, from a whole range of circumstances, but especially the scientists know we have something to contribute. The educational changes that are coming about because of the encyclical are phenomenal. I don't want to over-exaggerate because we know we have a long way to go, but if you take the Jesuit communities, 236 universities around the world, they are beginning to say, how can we teach environmental studies with a moral perspective? This was a conference on climate change at Loyola in Chicago, um, where they brought all the, Chicago, all the Jesuit universities in the Midwest together. And they're, be, they're creating a curriculum which is online, free, open source, on all the ecological issues and their moral dimension. Okay? This is transformative change on an extraordinary level. And there are high schools as well. We're working with high school teachers on how you teach Journey of the Universe, how you bring these, uh, these ideas forward. Now, I've said something about creating an academic field and this social force, which you know about, I'm sure, in your own areas, your communities, and so on. Was anybody at the climate march in New York, okay, in, in September 2014? Extraordinary, right? I've been to many demonstrations. I was deeply involved with civil rights 
went to Trinity in Washington, D.C., where Nancy Pelosi went, Kathleen Sebelius. We were all about transformative change, social justice, and the anti-Vietnam War. This march, of many marches I have been to, was extraordinary. And why? The religious communities were well represented. Kathleen Degman here in the front row has done a lot of work with Green Faith and other groups to say, to begin to mobilize these groups. So this was a watershed of the evidence of the religious and moral presence in New York. Um, growing this movement, I've just mentioned Green Faith in New Jersey, Faith in Place in Chicago, the Earth Ministry in Seattle. These are tremendous groups that have been at this for 10 and 20 years. We have the Catholic Climate Covenant based in DC, the Catholic Rural Life Conference in St. Paul is making terrific contributions. So what am I saying? I'm saying we have some resources already on the ground. We have people who've been leading this um, across our country, in Canada, the Canadian bishops have just put out a new uh, pamphlet, actually a very substantive one on the, on the uh, encyclical. So, we have something to work with. We're not starting at ground zero. <clears throat> Interfaith Power and Light, have you heard of this group? They work with churches, synagogues, and so on to green their, their buildings and, and bring this right down into the parish level. We have internationally Thich Nhat Hanh. I hope some of you have read his books, magnificent Buddhist um, uh, monk from Vietnam, a true reconciler. In China, in Taiwan, this nun has been doing amazing work on recycling centers, but also relief around the world, um, its ecology and its justice. The former bishop of the Episcopal Church, Catherine Jeffers Shore, she's a, a scientist. She's testified before Congress on climate change. And we have the evangelical community um, working on this as well, definitely. It's not always in the news, but they are, like Joel Hunter. Now, coming specifically to the encyclical, how many of you have heard of the patriarch Bartholomew? Good, I'm so happy. Because as you know, he's a tremendous friend. I, lo I love this picture of the Pope. He, we went on about five symposiums with the ecumenical patriarch on water issues all through Europe, but also Greenland, the Amazon, the Mississippi, he was trying to highlight water is sacred, just like the Native Americans are doing out in the Dakota pipeline. Water is sacred, we're protectors of water. The Orthodox patriarch and his theologians, especially John of Pergamon, have this beautiful, mystical sense that's been held alive in the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. This is a sacred universe. It's, these have been stunning symposiums, bringing high-level people from the UN, ministers of the environment from all over Europe, and so on. In 1997, I heard him talk at Saint Santa Barbara, the church there in Santa Barbara. He said, these are crimes against creation. This is ecological sin. Imagine, 1997, the tremendous influence on Francis is absolutely clear, and as I said, they are good friends, went, to, of course, to uh, help the refugees and so on. But this sense of ecology and justice with a mystical sensibility coming forward, um, these two, I think, are the leaders in the world right now on this issue. So with the encyclical, as I said, and we can't say it enough, it's a watershed moment. It is a watershed moment addressed to all the peoples of the world for ecological conversion. Now, the audience is extraordinary. I go to environmental conferences and they can't even believe, you know, there's a billion Christians, I mean, a billion Catholics and a billion plus Christians all together. It's a phenomenal audience, already primed with social justice concerns, not all, but many of them. Um, and the other religious communities, are responding. If you look on our website, every religious community has responded to this encyclical with a strong statement of support. Many of them have had conferences, including the Muslim uh, world in Turkey and so on. So we need to bring this forward, clearly. Do you catch my enthusiasm for this document? And I hope you catch it too. <laughs> it's, we are so blessed 
You know, we live with such sad, bad news, don't we, all the time. It's a difficult world we live in. I, we don't, I don't look at television, we don't even have one. I, I just filter it through, you know, internet. We've got to keep alive this hopeful vision, and that's what Francis is giving us. Um, so his short-term goal was to affect the climate conference in Paris last December. His long-term is this ecological conversion of people around the planet. Now the short-term goal he actually accomplished. One of our great policy people at Yale, his office is right across from mine at the School of the Environment, I said to him last summer, well, what did you think of the encyclical? Dan Estes, his name. He said, oh, I don't know, because the Pope didn't go for cap and trade and so on, one of these schemes. I was like, okay, you know, okay. He comes back from Paris, and we have a panel at Yale on this. He begins, he holds up the encyclical, and he said, this is what made the difference for the agreements in Paris, the encyclical. Can you imagine? Saying to an audience of you know, several hundred people at Yale, we have our work to do because people are inviting us into this conversation. And why? Especially because of this integration of justice and ecology. But for us, too, who've been at this work for some time, there's a deeper dialogue that we need to help birth, help midwife, this dialogue of science and religion, which has been too parallel. Uh, we need an integral vision here. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, now. Living Earth, the dynamic ecological systems. We can see them ecologically, we can see them spiritually and religiously. You see, how do all of our rituals come out of the seasonal cycles of nature? The monastic tradition, so important to Thomas, the sense of the dawn where the prayers were said, the midday, the evening, the dusk, and the, the night prayer that were woven into the cycles daily and seasonal. You see how profoundly are right into your, your group, your tradition, etc. And so that sense, why is Christmas at the winter solstice? You know, why is Easter at the equinox? We're trying to get that seasonal sensibility. We're part of a planet. And we have these rituals that can help people feel that. Um, so the living cosmology as well. We will get to the language that, that will translate this. I was talking at breakfast about how do we get to a language where this can be understood and experienced by many people. That is part of the goal here. So I'm just going to sort of conclude with three people that I think had something to do with the encyclical Francis very explicitly. Imagine 1,300 years and no pope had taken the name Francis. Isn't that amazing? But how fresh and how fabulous that uh, we have this opportunity now with a saint for the poor and a saint for the earth. The cry of the poor, the cry of the earth. That's the call of the encyclical over and over again. It begins, the encyclical begins with Mother Earth. Do you know how thrilled native peoples are that that term is right there at the beginning of the encyclical? Pachamama, some people are working with this idea and, and with these ideas of the, not just an indigenous sensibility, an indigenous living, breathing, feeling embodiedness of we are part of an earth and a universe. How thrilling, the Pope, rounds the encyclical right there. What a bold move. That is our common home. That's what he's saying. Our common home is this magnificent 4.6 billion year planet. The mystery, the sense of the divine is right there. That's why people want to be protectors of it. They want to be in touch with it. They want to feel the sacramental dimensions of water, of a Eucharist, of grapes into the wine that are not pesticide-induced. They want to feel that connection. The canticle to Brother Sun and Sister Moon gives us, and it's right there in the encyclical, this grounds for an incarnational spirituality. How splendid. This is a 2,000-year-old revelation, but it's a 14-billion-year-old spirituality. In the beginning was the logos. In the beginning is an inner ordering principle of all reality. 
It's the cosmic Christ of the universe. You see, this is why Teilhard was so deeply inflected by this brilliance, the hymn of the universe. The sacramental sensibility of our tradition is a unique contribution to this discussion. You see? It's a unique connection to this discussion. We can't baptize children with dirty water. How can we? Our sacraments are, are being desanctified, if you will. That's the call back to our embedded incarnational sensibility, moving us forward also towards a divine reality as well. And that's Bonaventure, again cited in the encyclical, the mind's path to God, but through the imprinting of God, of the divine, at every stage of this journey um, to God, through God, with God, in God. So the language then of fraternity and beauty, of sisterhood, that's threaded through this encyclical gives us immense grounds for reformulating what we might say in a sermon, how we might teach this, and so on. That kinship, which is central to the encyclical, invokes a universal solidarity on a grounds that we've almost never had before. A solidarity with people in different nations, with their struggles, and so on, but with the whole planet with the earth community, which is what Thomas kept calling us to, a solidarity with the earth community, people and planet. Teilhard, how many of you have read some of Teilhard? I would imagine most, yeah. You see, he is so present, even in a Catholic consciousness, waiting to be evoked even further forward. When in 2005 we did the celebration for the 50th anniversary of his death at the United Nations, a thousand people came. It was so full that we couldn't even get in the room. 200 people came from France. The head of the business, uh, World Business Council on Sustainable Development, the IMF chair, International Monetary Fund, Candace was there. Tremendous influence. And the next day at, at the Cathedral St. John the Divine, all over New York, we need to bring this brilliance, this luminous life forward. As Helen Prejean said at St. John the Divine that day, she said, we're breathing on the embers of a man named Teod. <laughs> and that sense will carry us forward with disempowerment, with paralysis, with despair, with confusion. You see, he brings that tremendous hope of this unfolding universe. Specifically, the mystery of the universe is mentioned in the encyclical a number of times. Teilhard is mentioned very specifically. Um, this sense of discovering God in all things, of a divine milieu. He's referenced. This is fabulous. We can bring it forward, you see. This hymn of the universe is exactly equivalent to praise be. This Umbrian uh, Italian phrase. Think of what the Pope did. He went back to an indigenous phrase of ancient Italian language. Praise be. Wow. If we can begin our day with just praise be. You see that invitation um, that is, I think, one of the grounding roots of any religious sensibility. Praise and gratitude. So this notion which Maybe we can talk about later, but energy and matter being woven together over time. This logos within, our tradition is rich and ripe with drawing this out, making this more evident. How can we destroy the earth if there is an inner divine presence to everything? How can we cut down trees madly if an acorn results in an oak. This, this is the inner ordering principle of all reality. You see, this unfolding nature of nature itself. So he speaks of the cosmic destiny of the universe. This is, it has its eschatology, it has its teleology. It's drawing us forward beyond ourselves to this hopeful promise uh, of the whole universe. The cosmic love in the Eucharist, Benedict picked up on this too. The last pope really loved Teilhard. Um, we can move this forward in all kinds of ways. Now, towards conclusion, we're going to also say Thomas Berry was explicitly present in many ways in the encyclical that I've already said, Leonardo Boff, and, and that moving forward. 
Thomas's books. We all know the dream of the earth, the great work. The sacred universe was, it came out just as he died. We did it with Columbia. The fact that Columbia chose this title, the sacred universe, was mind boggling to me. You see, again, the secular sacred dichotomy is breaking down. That book I really recommend to you because it has so many of the, his essays on religion and cosmology as understood as ritual, as cosmological ritual. You'll, you'll recognize your own practices in the passionist and monastic tradition. Um, and the Christian future and the fate of the earth, um, he gives that challenge to the Christian communities uh, that we know so well, that prophetic challenge. So for living cosmology then, he's drawing on Thomas Aquinas, which is quoted in the encyclical, one of Thomas Berry's favorite phrases. Thomas Berry named, took the name of Aquinas as his religious name. This sense of the diverse forms of life are what express the divine better than anything else. Take a look at it again. That is Thomas over and over again. And the fact that he's quoted through Thomas Aquinas, um, I think is a splendid sign. This new story in 78, you know, to Journey of the Universe almost 40 years later, it's a short period of time for human evolution, but it has a generative possibility. Um, this universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. So many people quote that way outside Christian communities. They get this subjectivity, this incarnational feeling. The idea then is an awe and wonder that evokes action and change for social justice, for environmental justice, for concern for the earth community. A reverence that evokes responsibility. These go together. They're not separate. You see, it's putting together the response of a magnificent planet to the needs of people. And that's why we did Journey of the Universe. The encyclical refers to the need for a shared story. I'm not claiming anything about the Journey of the Universe, but the Pope recognizes, as many people do, we need a shared story, recognizing difference but also unity. This is the film you saw last night and the book. Let me conclude with lines from Albert Einstein, who brings this all together, a science and religious sensibility. A human being, is a part of a whole called by us universe. A part limited in time and space, he or she experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. This is Teilhard's vision, it's Thomas's vision, Einstein's vision, the Pope's vision. Now it's our vision to pick up. Thank you so much. Yes. Would you say a bit more about the, the shared character of the story, the shared story that you've been talking about? How is it shared across so much different from the story? Okay, that's a wonderful, challenging, good question. The shared story. So we're in this period where we're appreciating, I think, the diversity of different cultures and religions. We're being called to this deep interreligious dialogue into a sense of brotherhood and, and kinship with people around the planet. And this is what the Pope does in the encyclical, especially by highlighting the presence of the patriarch's chief theologian. At the launch of the encyclical, there was John of Pergamon, theologian from the Orthodox Church. There was Hans Schulneuberger, the head of this Potsdam Institute that we're going to representing dialogue with science. And there was Cardinal Turkson, 
representing the Justice and Peace Council. So this sense of difference with both other religions, with other disciplines like science, Turkson being himself, of course, from Ghana, from Africa, um, right there at the heart of the launch of this encyclical is, is a partial answer to this question. We need interreligious understanding, interdisciplinary understanding, interracial understanding, and so on. Um, and this call for justice and peace and the integrity of creation um, is so central. It's saying respecting differences, but realizing we have evolved from, been birthed out of earth systems that have taken billions of years to bring forth human life. We are only 150,000 years as homo sapiens, still in search of our last name, sapiens, <laughs> you know. We are meaning-making, symbol-making, seeking animals in this huge universe. All of our religious bases are symbols for meaning-making within an unfolding universe. And there's no question that every religion has tried to provide its integrating story, its genesis story, and so on. But now, through the work, the tremendous work of scientists all over the world, from early physics and geology and, and so on, we have, for the first time, the possibility of telling this story as pearls strung together, a shared story for people all around the planet. So when we show Journey in China with Chinese subtitles or Korea with Korean subtitles, people see themselves in this journey because we also tried to build in the different world religions and so on. So this delicate balance of respect for difference but of aspiration for unity, for that which calls us forward. That's it's certainly the vision of the Pope. It's certainly the, the hope of journey of the universe. And it was certainly Thomas Berry's greatest hope that we would have a shared story that would give us the energy to go forward. And let me just say one other thing about energy. Teilhard <clears throat> was concerned, having come out of World War II, a stretcher bearer in some of the most vast destruction and tragedy the 20th century ever saw. It's impossible to imagine. He said, even in the front lines, he felt this emerging universe vision in the midst of tremendous tragedy. And then seeing Europe uncertain of its footing between the two world wars and so on, he said, our task is to ignite a human energy of meaning, of purpose, of grounding, of possibility, of hope. Because the existentialists were saying, it's all meaningless. You roll that ball up the hill, it rolls down again. You do it again, it rolls down again. There was no integrating vision of how to go forward. The EU helped to pick some of that up. But Teilhard and Thomas were deeply concerned about activating the human energy, the human spirit, the human drive. That's what the great work is about. That's why it has such an appeal. That's what we all are trying to do as well, activate this new energy. Megan. <laughs> This talk? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, in the back. This talk is being recorded, was the question. Wonderful. Right. No, that's a great point. The question of creation theology. Um, it's right here in this lineage. You know, I, I, I should add another slide, so that's how sympathetic I feel to the question. So creation-centered spirituality, trying to bring forward this vision 
of the integrity and beauty and complexity of life systems with a justice perspective. Absolutely congenial with what I'm saying. Yeah. Wonderful point, exactly. And that's what Teilhard would be saying over and over again. How do we get the energy to do that? The refugee release wor relief work, the trafficking work, it's connected to the energy of the universe. So it's relieving the pain and suffering of the earth community, very, very much so. And as I say, it can't be said enough how we have this sense of ju social justice and a concern for the poor in the Christian tradition, very robustly, I think, we do not yet have a similar robust feeling for the ecological devastation and tragedy. I mean, we were at a conference at the, with the Catholic Bishop Conference in, at CU, at Catholic University, back in November. It began with a well-known person, I won't mention, who works for the Bishop's Conference and said, well, I always thought, you know, ecology was, like wilderness and whitewater rafting kind of thing. I'm about the human, and I'm about what's important. And I can tell you, for more than 30 years, that's what we've gotten from various communities, including some Jesuits even, including various communities who said, we are doing the important work. We're doing the work for the poor. We're doing God's work. Of course you are. God bless you. You know, people who are doing this work, and many of you have done it, and your wonderful colleague in Haiti doing this incredible work with the poorest of the poor. It's just unbelievable to read his reports that Brendan shared with me. So bringing forward, though, that sense of goodness and compassion that brings us together. You see, environmental refugees, the refugees from Syria, are largely, not exclusively, environmental refugees. This began as a crisis, tremendous drought, which is all through the Middle East. They had to move into the cities. Things began to explode. Sudan is a complete environmental disaster. We were in Iran in April. They've almost lost a lake in the western part. We were in Iran in 2001. The president who held this conference on religion and ecology said, what we care about is the sacredness of the environment through our scriptures because we live in a desert. You see, this is something that can bring us together as people around the world. This urgency of ecology and justice coming together. But it's not just ecology as the study of science, the study of ecosystems. It's the study of ecology as a religious act as a spiritual contemplative moment. The prayer that, that Brendan recited is an exemplification of that extraordinary sensibility, isn't it? So again, what's so unique and can be empowering for us in the Christian Catholic community is this sacramental sensibility can be brought forward even at the parish level, absolutely. So it's a unique contribution, yes. Um, well, for one, not everyone will come into this vision, right? There's fundamentalisms, there's uh, apocalyptic book of revelation, people across the board. Um, but, you know, I would invite people to think about the apocalypse is happening right now on this planet um, with the fires in the West, with the flooding in Louisiana, with Sandy, with Katrina, and you name a hundred thousand people around the planet, places around the planet, the Philippines in that ex horrific uh, hurricane and so on that the Pope visited because it was so horrific. So I think we bring back the sense 
And it, it's a gospel sense, it's a sense from the Psalms, etc., of the beauty of creation is here before us. If we allow it to be devastated, extracted into industries uh, for profit only, not for people, that is not following the gospel. So the gospel has this at its heart. Look at the lilies of the field and so on. Um, it's, it's not going to be easy. I don't want to play down the, the many oppositions to this vision, but we do our best. You know, we go forward down this road, and that's what the Pope says too at the end. Let us go forward singing. I love that. You know, let's go forward singing. Um, so it's an imperfect answer to an important question, but we we try and gather a language and a prayer life and a ritual life around this vision. People will come. Maybe I'll end with this notion that. At, at the cathedral in New York, the Episcopal the Cathedral, St. John the Divine, for over 30 years, this vision has been embedded and embodied. Paul Winter and his Earth Mass, the Feast of St. Francis, first Sunday of every October. Several thousand people come. They bring their animals and so on. And they're singing for the praise of all creation. We, we go regularly to the winter solstice that he does at just before Christmas. 4,000 people celebrating this change of season. It's extraordinary. You see, so we have rituals that are emerging. We have music. Again, Kathleen Dignan sitting right here has an amazing voice in doing this in, in ritual. We are not bereft. We have some of the, the uh, resources to go forward and let us go forward singing, shall we? Thank you so much. <laughs>